In the gardens of the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, a Roman ruin is to be seen in front of the forest. Cracked bricks and fallen columns scattered around a pool of green water. The ruins hint of a time long gone, of an empire so powerful that its influence defies millenniums and the decay of time. They serve as a reminder of both the impermanence and the endurance of human societies. Except, the ruins are fake. Before the late 1770s, the Roman ruins in the gardens of the Schönbrunn were absent. The reason is entirely lacking in mystery. At the time of the American Declaration of Independence, James Cook's second voyage to find Terra Australis, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, and the teenage years of Mozart, the ruins hadn't yet been constructed. Ancient ruins have always had strong effects on those who viewed them. The Renaissance period was built around a classical ideal of perfection, where mythological motives were carved with impeccable realism out of white marble. The classical motives and techniques combined with contemporary religious and social ideals. During the Romantic era, however, the technically perfect aspects of ancient art were less important. What caught the hearts of poets and painters was the deeply melancholy and mystical aspects of these lingering memories of long-lost civilizations. The fragmented and crumbling state of ancient art and ruins came into focus. In his poems, Lord Byron focuses on the mystical and contemplative nature of the ruins of ancient Rome. In Child Harold's pilgrimage, he focuses on the relationship between the present and the distant past in his descriptions of Italy, and how, from the tension between the two, a sort of imaginative and contemplative magic is born. About the Colosseum of Rome, he wrote, when the stars twinkle through the loops of time and the low night breeze waves along the air. The garland forest which the gray walls wear like laurels on the bald first Caesar's head. When the light shines serene but doth not glare, then in this magic circle raise the dead. Heroes have trod this spot, tis on their dust ye tread. Similarly, in his 1818 sonnet Ozymandias, Percy Shelley explores the fading memory of greatness, where the power of a time long gone endures only as words carved into an ancient statue of Rameses II standing solitary in the deserts of Egypt. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Upon viewing the Temple of Vespasian and Titus in the Forum in Rome in 1764, Edward Gibbon was inspired to write his monumental work, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, a six-volume long work in which Gibbon attempts to explain the fall of the Roman Empire. In the penultimate chapter of the final volume of his work, Gibbon describes the relation between the ancient ruins and his present day. The forum of the Roman people, where they assemble to enact their laws and elect their magistrates, is now enclosed for the cultivation of pot herbs, or thrown open for the reception of swine and buffaloes. The public and private edifices that were founded for eternity lie prostrate, naked, and broken, like the limbs of a mighty giant and the ruin is the more visible, from the stupendous relics that have survived the injuries of time and fortune. The artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi depicted the same ruins of the Temple of Vespasian and Titus in one of his drawings, depicting the ancient columns by way of a juxtaposition. The Corinthian columns emerging from the ground, surrounded by nature, with the modern city surrounding it. The ancient and the modern, side by side, reflecting the Baroque idea of the flight of time. It was Piranesi's engraving of the Temple of Vespasian and Titus that served as the inspiration for the Roman ruins that were built in the gardens of Schönbrunn Palace in 1778. This kind of building is called a folly. A folly, also called an eye-catcher, is a costly and generally non-functional building erected to enhance a natural landscape. The Roman ruins in the Schönbrunn Palace was not the only place where the nostalgic fascination with bygone times manifested itself as follies. 
In the parks near Windsor Castle, an impressive Roman ruin is to be found called the Temple of Augustus. They appear as if they've stood there for millennia, an enduring relic of an era of greatness long gone. In actual fact, the columns and fragments making up these temple ruins were taken from the ruins of the Roman city of Leptis Magna in Libya. Between 1827 and 1830, architect Sir Geoffrey Wyattville used these fragments to construct an artificial ruin, and the result was given the name the Temple of Augustus. The Romantic era gave birth to melancholy and nostalgia for a mythical past, reason often giving way to a more emotional approach to art and history. As a result of this, especially in England, follies were prevalent. Castle ruins were built, along with decorative towers with a medieval ruin-like appearance, as well as, of course, buildings made to evoke the memory of the grandeur of the classical world. An idea pioneered by Albert Speer, one of the chief architects of the Nazi regime's planned city of Germania, is the concept of ruin value, or Ruinenwert. This idea focuses on creating new buildings with the thought in mind that if they eventually collapse, the ruins left behind will be aesthetically pleasing. Another German word, Ruinenlust, describes the pleasure of spending one's time amidst ruins, the aesthetic and emotional appreciation of decay. Ruins remind us of our own mortality and the power of memory and imagination. The ruins of the Colosseum, the Parthenon, the Stonehenge and the Pyramids, they're powerful because they suggest and suggestion leaves room for imagination. We see the remains of greatness and in these memories of greatness, we see a reminder of our own flawed nature. In many ways, this emotional and aesthetic fascination with ruins is similar to the Japanese art of Kintsugi, where broken pottery is repaired. The imperfections on the pottery aren't hidden or thrown away, but rather emphasized. This represents how beauty can be found in flaws, that the flaws are in fact the very thing that makes an object unique. In fact, the essence of an object's value rests in its flaws, because flaws are what gives it character. At the height of Romanticism, the emotional attachment to ancient relics rose to prominence. Poets and painters were inspired by the sights of crumbling ruins and how they were juxtaposed with modernity. In the gardens of 18th and 19th century palaces, follies made to resemble ancient ruins were raised. They inflamed the imagination, they evoked nostalgia for a long gone time of grandeur, and they reminded whoever observed them of the fleeting nature of time the impermanence and imperfections of human nature, and the importance and the beauty that is to be found upon observing crumbling, fading memories. The big question is, what are the follies of today? What do we construct in this new millennium to remind us of our transient nature and the tension arising from the juxtaposition of a fading past with the seemingly unbreakable monolith of modern life? Of course, millions of people travel to see ancient ruins every year. They visit museums and buy tickets to Pompeii and the Parthenon. But I'd argue that a close equivalent to the follies of 18th and 19th century Europe is to be found within modern entertainment. One such example of modern entertainment that evokes the same feeling as viewing ancient ruins is the TV series Succession. Now, this may sound slightly bizarre, what on earth could a piece of modern entertainment possibly have to do with ruins? In succession, we're presented with a deeply flawed family reigning like medieval royalty within the monumental cityscape of Manhattan. When watching it, the city itself serves as a central character. It reflects both the glory as well as the flawed nature of the characters. The drama of the characters unfolds like something that wouldn't have been out of place in a medieval court or on the stage of the Globe Theatre in the 16th century. Because of that, we as the viewers end up observing New York City and are present as a whole, as a period in time that has already faded. Because what is New York City in succession? New York City is an empire on the precipice of decline. We're witnessing these monumental characters living out their fleeting lives as deeply flawed emperors within this monumental city. The city makes the people, and the people make the city. And in the end, what we're witnessing is a kind of mutually assured destruction. 
As viewers, seeing this play out results in a melancholy similar to wandering among the ruins of an ancient city. We know the columns and arches were raised on the orders of people long dead, and now these fading memories are all that remain. The sheer monumentality of New York as it's portrayed in succession reduces the people living and working within it to ants or rats. The characters we're following, though not physically any different from any other people, spend much of their time high up in the skies. Therefore, the city serves as an active agent defining the structure of power. The city depends on that order of things. And the city is fragile, as fragile as the people who've built it. And when two fragile things depend on one another, it's only a matter of time before things start going wrong. That's what Succession manages to do. Portray our present, not like it's a ruin, but like it's a ruin in the making. That the fall of the empires of the present is as inevitable as the fall of Rome. The Wire achieves much of the same, exploring a society in decay through the eyes of the people trying to navigate the whims of the powerful in order to try and save the sinking ship of their world, represented through the city of Baltimore. The Wire uses shots of looming skyscrapers in a similar way as Succession. What results is that these monumental cities shapes and emphasizes the flaws of the characters, and vice versa. There are many examples in film of what could be described as modern follies. My personal favorite is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The three movies are spun around the central themes of the nature of decay and memory. The world we're presented with is scattered with the ruins of a bygone time. The elves are leaving the world, creating a deep-rooted feeling of melancholy that is as potent for the viewers as it is for the characters themselves. We're witnessing something beautiful fade away, giving birth to a whole new age. More on-the-nose examples of these modern follies are works of actual post-apocalyptic fiction like The Walking Dead, The Last of Us, Station Eleven and The Leftovers. The Walking Dead and The Last of Us are primarily interesting because they actually show us modern cities as ruins, which evokes a very real emotional connection with the fallen empires of the past. Visually, these works of fiction force us to consider the frailty of modern civilization. By showing us the ruins of our cities, these shows act as a form of morbid curiosity. We're seeing our lives reworked as an overgrown tombstone. We're viewing our surroundings in the context of decay and destruction. And we're left to ponder the question, why does it all feel so inevitable? Station Eleven explores how, after a global pandemic, which no company and power structure could survive, some things endure. Art and the passion and community that art evokes. The crumbling scenery of the modern world is reworked to create a new Renaissance-like reality, showing how the pillars of society are held up by our shared love for art. The Leftovers explores how humanity reacts to the meaningless and how people will grasp desperately for reasons and explanations, like children fumbling in the dark. The series is a profound meditation on loss and our reaction to loss, telling its three-season long story by, for example, playing with biblical parallels and the audience's often misguided expectation of getting answers to all the questions posed by a piece of media. These TV series highlight that it's our flaws that make us human. Our faith, our rationale, our hope, our hopelessness, our passions and desires. Our flaws compel us to build to the heavens. Our flaws tear our empires down into ruins. Like with the Japanese art of Kintsugi, it's our flaws that give us character, like the cracks in a piece of pottery, beautifully filled in with gold. Something broken, reworked into something unique, with its own history and its own kind of beauty. All of these, and more, serve as examples of the follies of today. They are pieces of art that serve as aesthetic and emotional reminders of the transience of human nature. We're driven to embrace these intrinsically human flaws as parts of our shared history and of our individual uniqueness, and therefore, as something beautiful. And we're encouraged to view our present through a lens as if we're observing the past. And that, more than anything, is what makes these follies of today so crucial to our understanding of the present. 
because to understand what is, one must embrace imperfection, and nothing is more timeless than the deep human fascination with ruins, impermanence, and the beauty of decay. I don't know why. It makes me sad.